Listen, so excited this morning because we are dealing with a very interesting topic, a very important topic as we continue to talk about the keys to spiritual warfare. We have been discussing this idea, this reality, this truth that the church has the keys to so much in our lives, especially for the believer. So the church definitely has the keys to spiritual warfare. Last week we talked about Jesus when he was dealing with the man who brought his son who had a spirit. The spirit that caused him to fall into the water and caused him to fall into the fire. It was a spirit of confusion. The King James Version said that it was a deaf and dumb spirit. In other words, uh, some people are overtaken by a spirit of not listening <laughs> or not hearing. Amen. And an argumentative spirit, a divisive spirit. Amen. So we talked about that last week. And this week, I want to turn your attention to another spirit. In the book of Mark, the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 5. And then also we want to look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. Look, let's look at Ephesians 6 through 6, 10 through 12 before we go to Mark. So we can just solidify this fact that spiritual warfare is real. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. And it says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength to put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in heavenly places. Now, I just pointed out to you the folks that will try to invade our fellowship, even by digital means, to try to deceive the children of God into or to swindle them out of their hard-earned money. We must be mindful of these things. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 20, I'll read in your hearing. It said, they came to the other side of the sea, to a region of the Gerasenes. As soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. The him is Jesus. He lived in the tomb. This is the man. And no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him. And he cried out with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. What is your name? He asked him. My name is Legion. He answered. He answered him because we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out into the, out of the region. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us into the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. The herd of about 2000 rushed down a steep bank into the sea and drowned there. The men who tended them ran off and reported to the town. 
in the countryside, and people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs. Then they began uh, to beg him to leave their region. And he, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. But Jesus did not let him but told him, go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. So he went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And they were all amazed. Hallelujah. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless this word on today. Decrease your servant and increase your spirit so that it may be your word may be delivered into the hearts of the hearers unto salvation, unto healing and unto deliverance. Those who may be oppressed. So, Lord, we do thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And also the Lord add to his word understanding. This is a very interesting passage of scripture. Last week we talked about the three areas of demonic activity. That there is demonic impression our influence. There is demonic oppression, and then there is demonic possession. In this case, the Bible tells us exactly what we are dealing with. We are dealing with the demonically possessed. It is interesting that we find ourselves in the Halloween season, and being someone who was uh, enamored, uh, enamored with and enjoyed a scary flick or two in my time when I see the example of this individual who is demonically possessed I cannot help but to think about some of the horrific horror figures in the horror films that I grew up with think of Jason Michael Myers Freddy Cougar and for some reason, my, my youngest son has been taking interest in Chucky, the little doll, as they have uh, recreated and reimagined him into a television series. And when it talks about this man having superhuman strength, it reminds me of those figures, you know, Jason could not be killed. Michael Myers, they could not be killed. They've been shot. They've been stabbed. They've been burned. They've been electrocuted. They've been drowned. They, 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 but they continue to come back over and over and over again, such as the narrative with these individuals. Some education who postulate and theorize this idea of multiple realities these ideas that have been captured into film as well my kids of course and I are fans of the Marvel franchise and in the Marvel franchise they have introduced Spider-Man into the multiverse, and it's based upon uh, theories of phys uh, physicists and scientists who have proposed the idea of multiple universes taking place 
uh, at the same time. I once heard the late Chuck Smith explain one of these ideas, and I'll try to explain it simply because they say if you can't explain it simply, you don't know it well enough. So I'm going to take the risk right now, but the concept of which he was sharing, and I forget the science that he was quoting, but this idea that at the atomic level there is space between our cellular makeup. And some folks have theorized that within that space of our cells, there exists another reality that is simultaneously occurring even as we experience the one that we are in. So of course Hollywood has taken those ideas and have uh, 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 produced films uh, that articulate those scientific beliefs. Friends, I don't know much about the physicists and the theories and all of those things, but I do know the Word of God. And the Word of God does not suggest that there are multiple realities. It confirms that multiple realities exist. It confirms that there is a natural realm, but also that there is a supernatural realm. There is a earthly realm, and then there is a heavenly realm, or a spiritual realm. And friends, we must understand, according to Ephesians chapter 6, that the problems we face are not all natural. The problems that we face can indeed also be spiritual. Now, we live in a scientific, sophisticated society where we have discovered certain things and we have treated it as such. We have stepped out of the dark ages. We have stepped out of witchcraft and barbarianism, sorcery, and these crazy ideas that people once held. But the problem is, I believe that we have become so sophisticated that if we have lost sight of the simple. Mm -hmm. We have lost sight of the simple. And I'm going to hopefully deal with that with you this morning. We got a long way to go and a short time to get there, so I'll jump into my points on this morning. Point number one, encountering a spiritual enemy. Now, Mark chapter 5 picks up after Mark chapter 4. The ending of Mark chapter 4 is the account of which uh, 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 the uh, Jesus and his disciples are on a boat crossing over the Sea of Galilee, and a storm hits, and Jesus quiets the storm. So they are coming out of a storm. Jesus has spoken to the storm in the Bible. In, in the last verse of verse of, cha of chapter four, said, "Who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him?" So they are coming out of a storm, and they enter in. When the Bible says in Mark chapter five. Verse 2, as soon as they got out of the boat, they are confronted or encountered by an unclean spirit. Friends, I want you to know that there are times in our lives that as soon as we come out of something, as soon as God delivers us from something, there'll be something else waiting on the other side. <laughs> the Bible said that they had gone to the other side and as soon as they got out of the boat, I mean, they are still in awe of Jesus speaking to the storm. They are still taken and amazed by the miraculous work of Jesus Christ in their lives unto their salvation. And as soon as they come out of this thing, they enter into something else. Somebody say another level 
another devil. <laughs> see, see, friends, you got to understand that the life we live as believers, as children of God, is a life of perpetual spiritual warfare, perpetual spiritual encounters. Friends, they lied to you if they told you that when you got saved, your life was going to be easy. Somebody mis has misled you or spoken a mistruth and have misrepresented the Christian life if you have been led to believe that when you came to Christ that your life was going to be on easy street. As soon as you come out of one thing, you'll be going into another. So look at somebody say, you better get used to spiritual warfare. The Bible said that as soon as they got out of the boat, a man, again, with an unclean spirit. Now, last week, the boy had a spirit, which we came to realize was also an unclean spirit. In this case, this man has an unclean spirit. An unclean spirit is a demon. Let's be very clear. In case you didn't know, there are spirits in this world that are not clean. There are spirits in this world that are deceitful and bent on accomplishing an evil agenda. We call them demons. These are fallen angels who are at the whim of Satan himself. Mm -hmm. So the demonic influence is all around us. Demonic influence, demonic oppression, demonic possession are real and true. The Bible said that this man lived in the tombs and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain. I mean, they tried to treat him with human hands. They tried to contain him by human means. They tried everything they could to subdue this brother, but he would not be subdued. He broke the chains. He smashed the fetters. Everything that they tried failed. This man was living among the tombs. Three things I want you to know about this man. He was living among the tombs. He was out of control, and he had a tortured mind. He was living among the tombs. He was not alone. He had companionship, but all of his companions were dead. They were lifeless. Friends, I've said it many times before. I think there is something behind the fascination we seem to have with zombies. There's something on a spiritual level that I believe that represents. I mean, every, they use zombies for everything, even outside of the Halloween season. Everything Zombie this, zombie that, zombie apocalypse, the living dead, the walking dead, the day of the dead, the night of the dead, the dawn of the dead, Z, zombie this, I am legend. Everything is about zombie. A zombie is nothing but a person who is alive physically, but dead spiritually. Mm-hmm. They don't, they don't, they, they are soulless. They are, they, they are mindless, but they are walking around. And if that does not describe the current human condition, I don't know what does. I think that that is a, an effective analogy or symbolism for the human condition. We are living around a bunch of spiritually dead folks. They cannot feel the spirit anymore. They are dead to the things of God. And in fact, even con common sense has become nonsense because folks are spiritually dead. This man was, had made a home in the tombs. He had made a home in the graveyard. He had gotten comfortable with being in dead situations. Friends, I, I, I'm talking to somebody this morning because I'm speaking to you. Have you gotten comfortable 
around dead people. The sixth sense. I, I see dead people. Uh, have you gotten comfortable in dead situations? Have you gotten comfortable in dead in predicaments? Have you gotten comfortable around dead stuff? Have you uh, uh, been in the life you are living so long that your sins have been dead? deadened to the spirit of God that they've been deaded to life can you well you can't even feel the lifeblood of Jesus Christ anymore where you can't even respond to his spiritual awakening anymore where you don't even understand or recognize his voice we are uh, 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 entertaining the dead this man was lived among the tombs among the dead and then he said he was out of control that mean he had no restraint does not the bible say my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge or because they have cast off restraint have you been doing the wrong thing for so long that you are now out of control i know you started uh, experimentally you experimented with drugs you experimented with sex you experimented with this that or the other you experimented with astrology and psychics you experimented but now you have gotten out of control see in our sophisticated society we bypass and overlook the spiritual connotations of our situation the spiritual root of our situation and we explain it through science our medicinal practices Somebody loses their mind, quote unquote, and we treat them with psychotropic medications. We treat them with psychological evaluations. We treat them with all of these human remedies. And we forsake and overlook the spiritual root of the problems. This man was out of control. He had could not be restrained. And lastly, he had a tortured mind. He began to self-mutilate. He began to cut himself. My heart goes out to all those folks who suffer with these various uh, mental illnesses and things going on. With folks, uh, I know it. All too well, I spent many years working in human services and social services and had to deal with young people who cut themselves or would harm themselves, self-mutilating behaviors, we called it. They would, I remember one child would get an eraser and used their eraser to rub their skin to the point of where it became raw and irritated and they would be and it was operating as an, an addiction. So, so, so nowadays in our sophisticated society, we have the DSMR, uh, DSM seven, and that's that's the, the whatever it is, the the, the big book on, on on psychiatric evaluation and, and, and nomenclature for various uh, uh, types of uh, uh, mental illness and, and things like that. And then we have a, a a a book that tells us, well, that's this and that's that and this is this. And then we have psychotropic medication, Zoloft and Wellbutrin and Prozac and all these things and we say well that's it and we, we treat it and, and, and we do all of these things but not realizing that there is also a spiritual attack, a, a spiritual war being waged on these individuals. This man experienced those things even back then and there's a biblical explanation for it. mark chapter 4 verse 4 he said because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles no one was able one was strong enough to subdue him so so even in all of this no one was able to subdue him and just like the man who brought his son to the disciples to be healed and they were unable to no one within their human strength of power was able to
to subdue this man. Just like the disciples were unable to cast out the demon from the boy, the unclean spirit. Friends, we must also make note that demonic influence or satanic influence is also very subtle and not easily detected. The enemy that we are confronted with, the enemy that we deal with, is a very subtle one. That's why Jesus implores us to be as wise as serpents, yet as gentle as doves, to beware the wiles of the enemy, according to Ephesians chapter 6. Why? Because the enemy is very subtle. There are subtleties all around us. He, he functions in the gray areas. He is a deceiver. He is the Lord of the flies. He's a liar. And he functions and operates in subtlety. It's, it's the subtle sins that tend to do us in. Subtly, he introduces things that would destroy us. And some of us are experienced enough and old enough to look back upon our lives and see how we gave in to the subtle temptations that led to something far worse. Mm -hmm. The enemy says, go ahead and have a casual drink or two. And before long, folks get addicted to alcohol. The enemy says, go ahead and pull that slot machine and engage in a little sports gambling. It's harmless. They even have TV shows now on the sports networks. It's been kind of interesting. All of these years, they've been, trying to, they've been trying to rid the sports world from the gambling, trying to separate it from the gambling aspects. I think of Pete Rose, who received a lifetime ban for betting on baseball, one of the greatest baseball players to ever live, but was ex basically excommunicated from the game of baseball because of gambling. But now they have shows on some of my favorite sport networks that encourage it, tell you the line and who to bet on and what the odds are and what the numbers are. So now there's a whole economy that they have quote unquote legitimized around gambling it is really interesting is it's really interesting just like alcohol the alcohol commercials that you see uh all the fun times that you will have if you just get a little hennessy a little Ciroc or something like that. And then at the end of the alcohol commercial, of course, they have the little disclaimer um, to tell you to drink responsibly, you know, all that stuff. And so the same thing occurs with the gambling thing. At the end of the gambling commercial, they have the little gambler's hotline. If you get addicted to gambling, call this hotline. So, so at the same time, they're profiting off of and marketing to you uh, 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 these strongholds, they also are giving you <laughs> a, 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 a solution to the stronghold that they are introducing you to. But they call the church hypocrites. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, let me keep on moving. Let me keep on moving. But we need to understand that, sat that satanic influence is often subtle. It's often indirect. And it's not easily detectable. In the days, we are becoming more and more aware of the effects of mental illness. Satanic influence and oppression is able to blend right in because it's able to emulate and it's able to look the same way. So in our sophisticated society, we operate without the spiritual truth so we only treat the natural we only say well they need some counseling or they need some medication that to get them straight and as one who has worked in the human services field and having at one time had 
the responsibility of distributing psychotropic medication to the residents that I worked with. Yeah, I used to be the person uh, uh, in the uh, night hours, in the early morning hours, that would actually give the young people medication like Wellbutrin and Zoloft and some of the other psychotropic. We kept them locked in all this stuff and I had the keys and I was the one that they would come to receive the medication. So I, I know what that those medications look like and uh, but I got to be honest with you, <laughs> uh, 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 most of the time in most cases, all it does is make the kid out of it. <laughs> yeah, they're not tearing up stuff anymore because they don't have the strength or the energy to it. The medication has them subdued so much that they can't can't do anything. It's like it's like Robitussin for your cough and cold. It just puts you to sleep, but doesn't really heal the ailment. So demonic influence is subtle, not easily detected. So friends, we have to be aware of this child of God as we deal with this these predicaments. Because I want to also point to you the fact of this. That whether it be direct demonic influence or not, or whether it be mental illness, and we're trying to determine which one it is when dealing with folks, we must know this truth is that all mental illness, pay close attention to me now, all mental illness is rooted in demonic influence. Yeah, all mental illness is rooted in demonic influence. Pastor Chuck, what are you saying? What are you saying? Uh, uh, now, now, let's be very clear. When sin enters the world in Genesis chapter 3, illness enters the world. Not just physical illness, but mental illness enters into the world as well. And let's also be clear as that it, it, with that as well. Mental illness is just as prevalent and just as real as physical illness. And we need to treat it as such. And I am grateful to our culture and society bringing that to bear. So however you shape it up, mental illness is still rooted in spiritual places. Mm hmm. Encountering a spiritual enemy. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, but full of land, the strongholds. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers of darkness. So, friends, child of God, people of God, the church of God, we must know this that we will encounter. A spiritual enemy. Number two, engaging in spiritual warfare. The Bible said in verse six that when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt before him. Oh, I got excited when I read that as I was prepared. He said, when he saw Jesus from a distance. And that just reminded me that when people see Jesus, they respond. Uh, uh, now, when people, now, 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 y'all stay with me, church. When people see Jesus, I'm talking to the church this morning. When people see Jesus, they will respond. Now, 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 people may or not may not respond when they see you, but when people see the authentic working of Jesus Christ, they will respond. The Bible said that this man who had been tortured and tormented by an unclean spirit saw Jesus from a distance. He saw Jesus from afar off and he ran. He did not hesitate. He did not procrastinate. He did not put off today what he tomorrow what he could do today. He did not hesitate, but when he saw Jesus even from a far off, somebody I'm talking to somebody that's far off this morning. Somebody that I'm speaking to this morning has been afar off, but 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 if you can just See Jesus from a distance. If you can just get a glimpse of him, I want to encourage this morning to run toward him. Stop running away. 
Mm -hmm. Stop trying to elude and evade the spirit of God. When you see Jesus, no matter how far off you may be, you need to run to him. The Bible said he ran to Jesus and he knelt down before him. That is a posture of worship. When you see Jesus, get yourself into a posture of worship. Jesus is not the one trying to drive folks from him. Mm -hmm. Jesus wants to draw folks to him. That's by the way he says, when I be lifted up, I will draw men to me. So when they see Jesus, I'm talking to myself right now, Pastor Chuck. Pastor Chuck, the people don't come to see you. Pastor Chuck, the people don't come to hear you. Pastor Chuck, they don't come to learn from you. The people want to see Jesus. Am I talking to any other ministers or pastors out there? Listen, listen, they don't come to see us. We we got to show them Jesus. I'm talking to the saints. Uh, the problem is we got too many ain'ts. Uh, we need some more saints. Uh, they need to see Jesus in you. When they see Jesus, they will run and they will worship. They will bow down like this man did, no matter how far off they are. That's why we cannot get frustrated. That's why we cannot get angry with folks. That's why we cannot lose heart when dealing with folks. All we got to do is keep on showing them Jesus. Make sure that they see Jesus when they see us. Make sure that they associate us with Jesus. Come on, I wish I had somebody to help me this morning. Make sure they, they associate you with Jesus. You may be the only Jesus somebody sees. You may be the only sermon somebody hears. You may be the only spirit that somebody experiences. You need to show somebody Jesus. When you wake up this morning, you should say, Lord, I pray that somebody sees Jesus in me. I pray that somebody sees the working of your power. I pray that somebody sees that I am an ambassador in chains, that I am an ambassador for Christ, that I am your representative in the world. Make sure when they look at me, they don't see all my faults. They don't see all my shortcomings. They don't see all my duality. They don't see my hypocriticalness. They don't see that, Lord. Lord, when they see me, help them see you. <laughs> Come on now, I might have to say that to myself in the morning. Lord, I'm looking at myself in the mirror, huh, and it doesn't look too good, huh, but Lord, help me when I look into my own reflection that I'm seeing you huh, staring back at me. Come on, Lord, cover me with your righteousness. Huh, cover me with your mercy. Cover me with your goodness, Lord, so that when I look at myself. I am not self-defeated. I am not among the dead. That I am not walking in the tombs. That I am not out of control and without restraint. That I am not tortured in my mind. That I don't have low self-esteem. That I'm not self-mutilating or self-defeating. Lord, help me see you when I look at me. Lord, help me with everything I'm dealing with. Listen, there's an, if there's an unclean spirit in me. Let it deal with you. Oh, I wish I could talk to somebody on this morning. I wish I had time to talk to somebody on this morning. I wish I had time to preach this morning. The Bible said when he saw Jesus from a distance, listen, we may have been a far off. Come on now, prodigal. Come on now, young man, young woman, old man, old woman. You stepped away from God. You stepped away for too long. You found yourself in the slop with the pigs. Oh, there is something to be associated here. The, if you find yourself in the slop with the pigs because you decided for yourself that God's way was not the way. You decided that you wanted to live your life the way you wanted to live it. So you went to the Father and said, give me mine now. I want to go out and party all night long like I was Lionel Richie. I wanted to go out and do my own thing and shake a tail feather. I wanted to go out there and get my freak on and, and all of these other things. You've been away too long. It is time for you to look afar off and see Jesus. And when you see him, don't hesitate. When you see him, don't procrastinate. When you see him, don't put it off. When you see him, don't try to wait till you clean yourself up. When you see Jesus from far off, make sure 
that you run to him. Who can you run to? Run to the cross of Jesus. Run and kneel at his feet. That means you got to come surrendered. That means you got to come correct. That means you got to come clean. When you see him like this man who had been tormented. Watch this. Watch this. The man saw Jesus. Mm -hmm. The man saw Jesus from a distance and he ran to Jesus and guess who came with him? All of his demons. He took his demons to Jesus with him. Friends, I'm trying to tell somebody right now. I'm trying to tell somebody right now. You can't rid yourself of your own demons. So I heard folks say, well, I got to clean myself up and then I'm going to go to church. I'm going to get myself right and then I'm going to go back to glow. No, you cannot clean yourself up. If you could, you wouldn't need Jesus. Listen, when you come, bring your problem. Bring your addiction. Bring your stronghold. Bring your demon to Jesus and let him deal with it. I've been dealing with this demon for too long. I've been walking in these tombs so long that I got used to it. I've been operating in dysfunction so long that it appears to be normal. the, The abnormal has become normal for me. Listen, the world is looking on the outside and wondering, why do I stay in this predicament? But I need to step from outside of myself and evaluate the life I'm living so I can see the foolishness of my ways. So he said he came to Jesus and he brought his demons with them. Come on now. That's why it's important for the church. That's why I'm telling you the church has the keys. The church has the keys to spiritual warfare. The church has the keys to the spirit of God. The church has the keys to unlocking and unleashing your potential. The church has the keys for destroying devils. The church has the keys for destroying and and, and, uh, dismantling the enemy's attack on your life. But you got to come to Jesus. Bible said he cried out with a loud voice. What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high? Don't you know that the demons recognize Jesus? The Bible said they know him and they tremble at his name. They know who he is. They know who he is. Notice they call him by his full name. Jesus, son of the most high God. They know who he is and they know what he can do. Mm Mm-hmm. This the demons talking. The demons know who he is and they know what he can do. They know what he's capable of. They know his purpose. They know his power. They know the anointing that is on his life. They know who he belongs to. They said, I beg before you, God, don't torment us. Don't torment me. Friends, I want to ask you a question. Who you who do you cry out to when you get tormented? What is your first response when you are dealing with something? Do you come to Jesus or you go to the pharmacy? Do you come to Jesus or you go to the dope man? Do you come to Jesus or do you head down to Hooters? Do you come to Jesus or you go to the bar? Do you come to the Jesus or you go to the psychic network? Do you come to Jesus or do you consult the stars? Do you come to Jesus or do you read your horoscope? Yeah, I said horoscope. That's why they call it a horoscope scope because that's exactly what it is do do you come to jesus or do you look for your zodiac sign Uh, do you come for jesus or you do you look to the moon to see what kind of moon it is uh, to wonder why you act in this way uh, why your mood has changed when you have a problem who do you run to Uh, do you call the psychic network Uh, come on y'all remember miss cleo Uh, listen even that's got real sophisticated now Uh, i was watching a commercial the other day it looked real good i was like man this is a good commercial Uh, they had good graphics Uh, they, they had people on there that looked like they had some sense but at the end of the day it was a psychic network commercial I said wow that is very subtle and sophisticated they done came up (laughs) it don't look it you know it used to be somebody sitting around a crystal ball (laughs) looking all weird and crazy (laughs) why would you call that person anyway I don't know why people do it (laughs) little tarot cards they got the little tarot cards they they put a card on the table and tell you your future (laughs) oh that's the gesture (laughs) oh that's this or that's that uh, listen, uh, who do you look to? See, see, my friends, uh, see, my friends, I want to encourage you today. Uh, a lot of us go, when we have a problem, uh, we look for over the counter. Uh, oh, we have a problem, we head on over to Rite Aid. Uh, when we have a problem, we go on down to CVS. Uh, we have a problem, we go to the Kaiser Pharmacy and try to refill our prescription. Listen, we need to stop looking so much over the counter and we need to start looking uh, uh, to the cross. Uh, see, we go 
before we go, we look over the counter or we look across the couch. Oh, I need to go get me some counseling. I need to go sit down with a psychiatrist to help me figure out my problems. Listen, I'm not belittling that. I have a degree in psychology. I have nothing but respect for the psychological and psychiatric uh, uh, practices and disciplines. I understand that they have use. I understand that they are effective in helping folks to deal with it. But when I go, when I talk about going to get counseling, you better make sure that you go see the ultimate counselor as well. Make sure that when you go and go into the pharmacy that you consult the great pharmacist who is Christ Jesus. See, a lot of folks are looking for over-the-counter solutions. They're looking across the couch when they should be looking at the cross. They're looking for over-the-counter solutions instead of looking into their hearts. Oh, yeah, I'm about to get into it right now. About to get into it right now. Friends, we need to stop looking so much across the couch and start to look at the cross. Uh, we need to stop looking so much at human uh, 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 prescriptions and start looking to spiritual uh, uh, awakening. Oh, come on, I wish I had somebody to help me on this morning watch this watch this the bible said in verse 8 of mark chapter 5 he said for he had told him come out of the man you unclean spirit i love jesus response mm. last week i told you the importance of speaking to spirits a lot of us get caught up in, conf in, 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 in conversations and arguments with people when in actuality there's a spirit that is influencing them so much that the person actually uh is not very present in the interaction. We got to do like Jesus. We got to use the formula that Jesus uses right here. He said, come out of him, you unclean spirit. In other words, game recognizes game. <laughs> yeah, that's, how we, that's what we say in the hood. We say game recognize game. Spirit recognize spirit. Jesus knew what he was dealing with. For all this time, these people have been trying to deal with this man who had made a home in the cemetery, who was running around like Michael Myers, <laughs> breaking chains, crying out, uh, self-hurting himself, engaging in self-destructive behaviors. Now, friends, you may not have, you may not be cutting yourself, you may not be rubbing your wrist raw with an, uh, the back of an eraser. Uh-huh. You may not be picking at yourself and, and, and doing those things, but, but, but you might be engaging in some self-destructive behaviors. Same spirit. Same spirit, just manifesting itself different ways. But Jesus recognizes that we're not just dealing with an individual. He's, he's not just dealing with a man. He's dealing with an unclean spirit. So he... Having authority. Remember, uh, 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 back in chapter four, they said this man speaks as one having authority. Mark chapter one, excuse me, Mark chapter one. See, Jesus had dealt with unclean spirits many times just in the book of Mark, chapter one, twenty three, chapter one, thirty two, chapter three, verse eleven, the book of Mark. You can look at that in your study time this week. Unclean spirits are commonplace. Watch this. Even in ministry. Somebody say, ouch. <laughs> Woo! Unclean spirits are commonplace. You don't believe me? Let's, let's look at those scriptures that I, I, I just quoted you. And then we're going to wrap it up, and we're going to pick this up next time. Because I got so much more, and I don't want to shortchange nobody. Mark chapter 1, verse 23 to 26. Look. Unclean spirits are complex. It said, watch this, watch this. Let me, let, me, let me pick up in verse 21. Mark chapter 1, just a few pages over. Verse 21. They went, in, they, they went into Capernaum and right away entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and began to teach Jesus. They were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not like the scribes. So he was teaching as one who had authority. Something was different about him. But look what happened. He said, just then a man with an unclean spirit was in their synagogue. He cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? The demons know who he is. So, so did you catch that? Where does he encounter the demon at? This man with the unclean spirit. In the synagogue. 
Look at somebody say, the devil go to church too. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Let, 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 let's go back there. Before we, let, 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 let's go back there. Ephesians chapter 6, Galatians, Ephesians chapter 6. Let, let, let us be clear right here. Right? See, see how scripture works together? Ephesians chapter 6, verses uh, 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 verse 12, for we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of darkness, against evil and spiritual forces in the heavens. Ma Mark chapter 1, verse 23, this man with an unclean spirit was in the synagogue. Now, the synagogue is not a direct uh, 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 equal to the church, but it was the precursor to the church. Okay? So, we can, so it's safe for us to say that unclean spirits come to church. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they ride in our cars. Woo! Oh, my goodness. Sometimes he carpools with us. You get up in the morning, get ready for church, start arguing and fussing, and your spirit is wrong and just off, and you come on to church and you bring that negative spirit into the sanctuary with you. So the devil come to church, and sometimes he carpools with us. Yes? Watch this. So the man, the unclean spirit was in the church. Here again, let's look over at verse 32 through 34 of the same thing. It said, when the evening came after the sun had set, so they brought to him all those who were sick and demon possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door and he healed many who were sick and various diseases and drove out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Come on now. I'm trying to tell somebody this morning how to deal with demons. Jesus dealt with demons in his ministry. We deal with demons in ours. If he, uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 11. Let's look at it one more time. Dude, dude, this is good stuff. It said, whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. Game recognized game. Jesus recognizes these unclean spirits. And he has given us wisdom and discernment to be able to recognize them as well. But we got to be filled with the spirit. We have to be spiritually minded. Remember I said on Wednesday, what we need is a kingdom-minded, Christ-centered, spirit-filled church. We need kingdom-minded, Christ-centered, spirit-filled believers. Because why? Because game recognize game. Because spirit recognize spirit. If we're going to engage in spiritual warfare, then we got to make sure that first and foremost, we are aware that we're in it. Sang song, the art of war. Know your enemy. Know what you're dealing with. Jesus knew what he was dealing with. That's why he spoke directly to that spirit. Come out of him, you unclean spirit. Oh, my goodness. This is good stuff. I wish I had some time. I wish I had some time to get into this, but I, I need to wait so I can make sure that I expound this well and bring it to a proper conclusion. This man had an unclean spirit. He was walking among the dead. Somebody out there tonight, today, you may be walking among the dead. You may be counted among them. You know what Halloween is all about since we're in the Halloween season? For those of you who don't know, the tradition of Halloween got its uh, beginning uh, in the belief that there was a night, All Hallows' Eve, there was a night... Um, during the harvest season where the dead will come back to life and walk and wander around the town. So the people would disguise themselves in costume to blend in 
with the dead spirit so that they could not be discerned. So that's the idea of Halloween. That's the concept of Halloween and dressing up to disguise yourself so that you can blend in with the dead spirits. Oh, my goodness. This is whoo. I've even seen I've seen a few zombie movies in my time and I believe can't remember the exact film, but that was the strategy of the uh, characters of the film was that they walked out among the zombies in a way where they pretended to be one of them. They were able to matriculate their way through the crowd of zombies. How many of us today have disguised ourselves to blend in with dead folks, with dead stuff? How, us, how many of us are walking around with this affront, this front, this disguise. We camouflage the curse by cosmetizing the corpse. We look good on the outside, but we're dead on the inside. This man Lear had made a life, a home, with the lifeless. But when he saw Jesus from afar, he did not hesitate to run to receive deliverance.